Hi everybody and welcome back to Wargame Central. I'm Zach Burley. Apologies, it's been so long since I've done one of these, but <clears throat> you have to imagine that during the um, 2020 year where everything was shut down, I had plenty of time to make videos and play games and then as things have picked back up uh, for myself personally, obviously that time has decreased, so just hopefully able to get up some more stuff more frequently, but there's no promises, so Enjoy, enjoy it while you can. I decided to break out Fields of Despair for this one. Um, I was debating on what to bring out because I try not to do videos that other people have done things on because, you know, you, they do a good job and you've already got that content to watch. So I try and make things that no one has seen, both because it's good for um, numbers, obviously putting something up that people have watched before, people don't watch as much. Whereas something that no one's seen before, there's not a lot of content for more people watch. So for a lot of reasons, I try and play things that people haven't played yet. Um, so I was debating between a couple of things. I was going to play Gandhi, um, the coin game, because I really like that one. It's one of my favorite coin games. Um, somebody had already done a solo version, but had not played a multiplayer version. Um, and you know how I am. I don't. Um, if there's a solo version, I don't do it, really, because by the time it takes you to run through the solo stuff, like there is in this one, you can play the... Um, Germans as um, a bot faction. The time it takes you to run through all of that, you can just make the decision yourself, and oftentimes it's better than the decision the bots make. Um, plus, you actually get to think about it rather than let the bot do it. So I really don't, unless they can, can create a computer version that does it for you, and I realize I can play online, I don't see the point of um, using bots. So, um, obviously no one's tackled this because it's a hidden block war game. Who wants to play that? Um, unopposed. You know all the stuff um, there is. Well, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. I think I'm fairly impartial in these things, and it could be interesting. But this is one that hasn't been done a lot. Um, Gandhi, I was thinking about, and Dian Abyss, that's my favorite coin game. There's a little bit of stuff on that, um, but not a whole lot. Uh, I'll maybe think of some others along the way, but as far as what you want to see in the future, let me know. I'll let you know if I have it. I had some requests to play Paths of Glory again. Um, which is tempting. I don't know if I'll do that only because, once again, I've done it before, but we'll see. Um, as this goes, though, this is a really good block war game. I don't actually own... This is the only block war game I own, and I don't play a lot of them. I have played um, the block war game. I don't remember the name, but it's based on the Crusades. Um, you have the Crusaders and the um, Defenders of the Crusades, um, Saladin and all that stuff. Um, I've played that before. It was very fun. I think I won, but I don't really have a lot of experience otherwise. I've played this one a couple of times, never all the way through as far I never made it to the end of the war. Someone has won before that. But um, it's a lot of fun. I think it's brilliant in the way that it encapsulates the different stages of the war. So there are nine turns broken down into action phases. And then, as you can see, they're kind of separated by three blocks. That's 1914. This is 1915-16. And this is 1718. So it does a really good job of splitting up the stages of the war, making them all feel unique and different, um, giving you a really good idea managing through these boards, all of the different things, like the way it handles artillery, super simple. The way it handles uh, aircraft, super simple. The different tracks and everything really boil it down to what you need in an elegant way that I really enjoy. Um, the combat, straightforward, simple. Um, it, it really gets down to the heart of what um, World War I combat, at least on this scale, um, the grand strategy scale, was like. Uh, this, the American Civil War is my conflict that I know the most about. But World War I is number two, um, and it's uh, one of my favorites, as you'll know from my Paths of Glory series. So to start things off, I did the setup from 1914. We're going to run through the whole thing or as long as we can. Um, I did not do the variable setup, which you can do, or you can place wherever you want. I did the standard one, but I will do all the other optional rules. Now, I'm not going to use all of them, but I will have the option to use them. So what am I talking about? Um, in the regular game, you can use this opening move down here at the end of the game turn track. And you can see it down there. Um, you can use it, and it's basically you get to go back to back as the, the Germans, as the central powers. And you can do two attacks. Well, the caveat to that is you have to use one of those attacks in Belgium. You can forfeit that if you want. And um, 
not attack through Belgium, which therefore will not break the neutrality treaty that they have with Britain, which will not bring the British into the war. So you can elect to do that. Now, that's the variable setup and then choosing not to go through Belgium. Um, so I, I elected to do the variable setup, but then set it up exactly as it would because I am going to go through Belgium. Um, we could, in theory, just shift all your forces down here, have them on the border. The French will do the same thing, and then it's just literally a slug to try and break through without using Belgium, which would be fun, but I'm not going to do it this time. Um, the Schlieffen plan will be what we go with. I think it gets a bad rap sometimes, uh, but it was very close to being successful, um, at least in the First World War's um, iteration of it. Um, obviously more so when you have tanks and planes to back you up in World War II. So that'll be the objective here. Obviously it's set up just like it was historically. Heavy, heavy German forces in the north guarded by virtually none for the Belgians and a small BEF force here in northern France. Primarily the French are in the south. The way this works is, as far as victory goes, is the 1914 year, so the first three turns, are based off of victory points on the board are listed victory point places. So plan 18 or plan uh, 17, sorry, um, victory point spaces for the Germans. Um, there's other ones over here. So basically there are across the map uh, different hexes that if you control them, you get points based off of that. Those really only apply for the 1914 turn. 15 and 16, 17, 18 are more based off hexes controlled. So during this first stage of the war where things are much more mobile, it will be about controlling those hexes. So this shouldn't surprise you if you know anything about World War I. The French are going to, I mean, obviously they are acting under surprise because they're being attacked from through Belgium, but they're going to try and pivot to hold, but really push here in Germany because if um, they can take these Plan 17 hexes and maybe another one of the victory point spaces because it's very lightly defended down here. They may be able to win in 1914. And I think as far as the Allied powers go, their best bet is to win early or to win at the end. That's really it. Like they can last the whole game and they'll probably win or they got to win early. So they're going to push and go early. Maybe a bit of a gamble, but we'll see how it goes. The Germans, very easy what they're going to do. They're going to bust through in Belgium push through into the uh, northern France and go for Paris. If they ever capture Paris pretty much at any stage of the game, they automatically win. So that's going to be their objective, nothing too strange there. So pretty much historical. Um, I'll see how much I go into depth as far as the explanations go. Obviously, I don't do rules explanations. There's stuff like that out there. Um, oh, by the way, other thing it doesn't come into effect yet, but the way they also balance the Eastern Front and Naval Warfare is lovely. I love it so much. So... A lot to like about this game. I hope you're excited for it. I know I am. Uh, let's hop in with the German opening move. Okay, so we've started off here with some opening moves. The way the opening move goes is that you can attack as the central powers in Belgium, but you cannot move into any hexes or use any reconnaissance in French hexes. So um, we just shuffled around some forces here, moved them around, uh, going to pull back to Strasbourg, just in case the French try and go straight for the jugular. We can let them take these hexes for now, it's fine. Um, and reposition so they can't make a big break there. It's probably safe because it's a 4 fort, but just in case. And then shift it down and around here to fortify the center, which could definitely get a big push. Um, but Belgium, obviously, is where the big stuff is happening. So let's take a look up here. Um, so... Went ahead and just pushed into the Meuse River, um, where most of the, the British, or sorry, the Belgian resistance is going to be. Um, you know, elements of the, I forget if, if this is the first army down here, and then up here is the, like the seventh and the eighth, or if it's the other way around. It's escaping me. But uh, basically, it's going to be a door hinge, you know, down on the south side. It's going to kind of push like this, like it's a, like it's a door, as was the idea. So we're going to have battles at Liege, Namur, and Antwerp will be next turn. But when I had jumped out here with some cavalry to kind of push into Brussels and eventually jump our way out. So lots of big forces in this area. Uh, so we can choose as the active player which one of those we want to do first. 
um, or I think we assign artillery first and there's no limit to the amount that you can place so we're definitely and they can't use any artillery in defense um, we're gonna use Big Bertha for sure in liege basically like a giant bunker buster and then normally the opponent would get to place artillery but they can't and you would do these face down um, and then we'll do three here I don't really think it matters because um, they can't respond and we get it back at the end of the turn and then we can resolve whichever one we'd like first we're going to resolve Liege first and in order to use Big Bertha as a um, the way we want to because it's special we have to spend a logistics point we'll go over that other time but spend a logistics point Big Bertha now turns into a rail gun and that allows us because it has this little black number there it tells us it's special and basically you can use it in a hex where there is an enemy fortress and use those four dice to get hits directly on the fortress. So trying to wipe out the fort in Liege, which happened historically, and that way we don't have to fight it. So we will take four dice and we are rolling on fives and sixes. So fives and sixes are hits and hits reduce the fort, so a hit would reduce it down to one, another hit zero, and then the remaining, if there were, would go onto the block. So if we get four hits here, we completely wipe out the Belgian forces. So we have three hits, two fives, and a six. We'll definitely take that. So that two of those hits are gonna go to removing the fort. Um, I believe a fort can be completely removed via this way. Something tells me that it can't otherwise. Maybe it's only with Big Bertha, I'll confirm that and come back before the next one. And then that last hit will go towards reducing the Belgians from two to one. So now we can do the artillery here. Um, we can't target the fortress anymore because uh, we don't have Big Bertha there, so we just get, oh sorry, let me finish it here. We get one more um, artillery roll because of this we roll a one so it doesn't hit. Um, but then up here, we get five dice. Um, the fort provides one for each step of the fortress, so the fort will be rolling two. We'll be rolling five, and these, I believe, hit on only sixes, but it might be five and six. Let me confirm about Leash if you can destroy forts and then what they hit on. Okay, so it's, the, it's actually not the way I thought it was. You can never completely eliminate um, forces by artillery. If there's one left and you get a hit, it's still going to be one left. You can't eradicate everybody, which makes sense. Um, forts can be. The way it normally works is, and let's say we have five dice here, and we roll two sixes, two fives, and a one. Um, it is hits on fives and sixes, by the way. The first six would go to reducing the fort, and the rest would go away. So you can't eliminate a fort on a single roll. Um, that's not the way it works. So, um, and forts also, fortresses also let you ignore um, hits that are fives um, on infantry blocks. So, this is good here. Um, we couldn't have eliminated this block anyways. So now we go to Namor, where the um, allies will get two. Central powers will get five. Alright, so that is two fives. Um, four, three, and a six, and the allies get a six and a four. Um, that will be a hit on the central powers, so it's down to seven. And those two fives um, can be ignored because they have a fort a fortress there, so no hits will be dealt. Now we're going to go on to infantry combat, which works the same way. I don't know if it has to be resolved in the same order or if I can then choose. You do have the right of refusal as the active player. You can choose not to continue a fight, which is more prevalent when you get into like the middle and late stages of the war. You may just want to soften up a position. Um, you never get to reveal the blocks when you use artillery, so you can't like hit them and see, okay, well now they had, they had eight, now we're at seven. It doesn't give you any information. But you could have used reconnaissance to figure out, okay, well, there's eight in this hex. We dealt two, so now there's six. 
I've got eight. That's not quite enough to where I want it to be. I'm going to wait a turn. So you can always elect to um, back off, basically, um, instead of attacking, which also, once again, makes sense. So the way artillery, um, the way infantry combat, excuse me, works is really clever as well. They came up with this combat table that allows you to not have to roll a million dice, which is really nice. So anything over 13, you get to use this table. So we're going to go here. And now for infantry combat, we'll reveal. It's one for the British, I'm sorry, the Belgians, and 17 for the Germans. So rather than having to roll 17 dice, what you're going to do is you're going to roll three and then look on this table. So we'll um, go here. So it's a six, a five, and a three. Well, obviously, we don't need much here. Um, if we rolled three ones, it would be the only, or no, sorry, three. Basically, if we got five or less, it would be pretty hard not to win here. So just for sake, it's 11, 14 is the total. So if you look on this chart, not sure how well you can see it, 14 under 17 strength points gets you four hits. So we can remove four strength points, strength points worth of um, damage, and those only hit on um, sixes because it's infantry. They roll a six, which is going to be enough to reduce um, down from 17 to 16. And obviously, we did enough to get rid of that Belgian block. So that will take this space. And hex number one in Belgium has been taken. Pretty easy. Stay that block back up. Liege has fallen. So now we'll go here. Not quite as good of numbers because the big, I think this is the first army. I think it goes one to whatever, but I could be wrong. Let's call it the first army. The first army is going to go for Antwerp or just keep running on. So we send in like the lesser third army, I think it is. Maybe it's even the fourth because this could be combined one, two, three, four, and now we're at five. Um, so it's going to be two for the Belgians against seven, nine for the central powers. So in this case, we can roll enough dice, so we will. So here is six, seven, eight, nine, and the allies will roll two. Okay, we only hit on sixes, I believe, because you need like mustard gas or something else to hit. So there's only one six. So we're using the one. They roll two, and they get a five. So that's none as well. So that one is pretty much a dead heat in um, no more. But we're gonna. The nice thing about this opening move is we get to go first again. So we can move in more forces and just we'll be through Belgium by the end of our action round on action phase of the next turn. We'll be rolling through. Plus we'll get to engage in France. So not a bad opening move, could have went better, but we'll take what we get. Okay, so we're on to turn one or action phase one of turn one. And just to clarify, hits are on six and five. I, I knew this, but I knew that a fort also means that you only take hits on sixes um, for fortresses in, uh, in, in a location. Uh, but this five right here should hit for the Belgians because there is not a friendly hex for the Germans. So that should be correct now. Um, I'm not going to take you through all of these um, little inter-phase uh, turns. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what happened most of the time. But I do want to show you, if you've never played this game, it's rather brilliant the way that they resolve the Eastern Front and naval warfare. Now, some people may think this is oversimplified, but play Paths of Glory, you know, like, that's a much more complex game. But you have these two bags, uh, beautiful red color, beautiful blue color. Blue is for naval warfare, red is for the Eastern Front. And during this um, sequence of play step, when you're doing the production phase, 
you're going to resolve the, these different areas that kind of simulate the other parts of the war, but you still have an effect. You still can affect them. They don't just simulate. You get to make choices and uh, delegate or uh, assign resources there to help you be more successful. So we'll do the Eastern Front first, which is down here. Basically, it moves um, down this track towards 7, which is the fall of the Tsar. So basically, the beginning of 1917, pretty much historically, um, the uh, Russians will come out of the game, and you can move all the forces you have on the Eastern Front back to the Western Front. Um, I don't actually know if there's a way to make it go faster, um, but there may be. Um, I know that you have a certain number of troops, German troops, that are committed to that front, and more will get added over the sequence of the game, and you can lose them and that sort of thing, but I'm not sure if there's actually an effect um, of having a certain number. I guess if you can't lose the number of forces, it, bad things happen, but basically I'm going to draw three cubes out of this red bag, and if I get red cubes, we're going to lose troops on the eastern front. Basically, it just means Russian successes. If I draw three red cubes, it's going to be a major Russian victory. And if they ever have three major Russian victories, that means Berlin has fallen and the game ends. So there is, you can just lose off of this one track. So, you know, you can focus all you want on the Western Front, but you cannot forget the East. So let's draw out of the bag. Right now there are four reds and three black cubes. Black cubes are just like nothing happens, good for us. Red or not. So first cube is red. So there's obviously a pretty good chance we draw three here. Um, as is makes sense in the beginning of the war, it's much more even. Black cube, okay, so we're going to avoid a major Russian victory. And lastly, out of the bag is another black cube. So it's just about as good as we could have asked for. So now we're going to say, okay, we only have one red cube. We're going to roll on the eastern front loss table and roll a d6 against this one red cube we got. We get a two, which is pretty good, and we're gonna lose two um, on the eastern front tracker. So can you see, yes. Right now we have nine. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be nine or 10. I think it's supposed to be 10, um, but I'll fix, fix it if it's not. So we're gonna go from 10 to nine. We're gonna lose one troop there. Uh, or sorry, two troops, so down to eight. Um, and like I said, I don't know what happens if that gets to zero, um, but you get reinforcements there, and I don't think you can actually send any of your own. These go back in the bag. Um, there is more to do on this phase, and I'm not going to walk through all of it because I have to make decisions for both teams, but I will come back and tell you about the naval warfare because that's also very interesting. Okay, so some reinforcements have come in for both the sides, and they are about to spend their economy points is what they're called to increase maintenance tracks and technology and that sort of thing. But first you have to do this naval warfare step, which is really interesting. It provides you with a couple of different options. So um, what they're going to do is draw out of this bag, this blue bag, there are blue, black, and white cubes in here. Blue cubes favor the Allies, black the Germans, and white are basically just removed from the bag. We're going to draw three and I will tell you what the options are from there. So there's a blue cube. There's a white cube. And there's another blue cube. So what this means is blue are good for the allies. The, uh, this is basically like blockading um, Germany and the Central Powers. So this is going to reduce the amount of economy points that the Germans have by two, from eight to six. It's also going to increase the naval blockade marker by one. So the higher and higher it gets, the worse and worse it is for the um, Germans. Uh, and the white will be removed, so then there's now one less white cube. If there had been a black cube in there, um, there would be an option for the Allies, or rather the Central Powers, to declare unrestricted submarine warfare, which there wasn't a black cube drawn. But if there was, I can already tell you I would have declared it. Um, there's a double-sided thing of if you 
Um, get a black cube, you can increase this unrestricted submarine warfare track and you can reduce the number of British um, strength points in England. It can actually get pretty hefty, the amount that you can remove, effectively just taking out strength points that otherwise go in, uh, reducing obviously the uh, British economy and their efforts to support the war. Um, so it can get pretty nasty. The, the flip side thing is it's going to move the U.S. entry track forward. Uh, it'll move it forward by one for sure the first time you do it, and then from then on out only if you draw two black cubes and roll a six. So it's got to be pretty bad after that. But obviously doing it will obviously will move it up. Um, so instead of coming in uh, in turn eight, it'll come in in turn seven. And then if you roll it again, it'll be turn six. So you can really move up um, the speed at which the Americans come in if you're very successful. But um, once again, I don't think anyone is coming into this with the hopes that this lasts until 1918. They're all very much wanting to get home by Christmas, as is the um, Adam uh, adage. So uh, they're going to go for that, but there's no sense in doing it now because it would not have worked. So that's how that works. Uh, players are going to go and spend their economy points now. Okay, so here we are at the beginning of action phase one. Um, just to recap what happened during the production phase, uh, the Allies had four economy points. They spent that to get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more artillery, um, increase air maintenance. They bumped up their aircraft um, technology track by one. Um, maybe did something else, but it wasn't consequential. They got a lot of troops in at Paris, and some British forces are trying are beginning to show up in England, which is why the uh, Germans wanted to uh, get that strategic un unrestricted submarine warfare off, so they could reduce those blocks and keep them from coming in. The Germans spent theirs similarly on similarly on artillery. Um, increased their poison gas technology, put two cubes in the eastern front bag, one cube in the naval warfare bag, so they're really trying to ramp those up, um, and I think that's it as far as what they did. So now it's on to the action phases. The initiative player goes first. No one bid on the initiative because the allies know that the central powers want it early. They don't care. The central powers knew that they could probably get away with not spending any because why would the allies with only four points waste any on that when at this point it's not really that important to them so since it didn't uh, no one bid it stays the same um, so the central powers go first and basically they'll do their thing the allies will do theirs then we do a second action phase for this turn where we do the same thing and then the turn is over so for the beginning parts you do um, aerial dogfighting and reconnaissance Dogfighting doesn't come in until turn two, where the planes actually fight. This is just putting out airplanes and trying to see what is behind the cubes. So the Germans decided to do none. They did zero for two reasons. One, they weren't going to attack the French, so there was no need to see what they had, um, because they don't really care. Um, they, they were only going to attack the Belgians, Belgians, and they know the Belgians have very little forces, so that wasn't really a problem. Second reason is they wanted to keep all of their aircraft in reserve for use in defending. So when your opponent places aircraft, you can place them as well to defend. Now, normally for most of the game, they'll, those two will actually fight, and one will be shot down, the other one won't be, or the other one will run away, whatever it is. Uh, but in this stage, it's just whoever has the most. So if they can stop the French from seeing their blocks, that is a positive, because they moved around a lot of forces in here before there was none in this area and there were some that came in from Koblenz that were further back. So basically they've shifted around and there are not necessarily some weak points but some weaker points that they don't want the French to have any knowledge of. So let them operate blindly if they are going to counterattack. They really wanted to seal this gap between the northern part of the hinge or the northern part of the door and then shore up the southern part near the hinge of the door um, to keep them from going into Strasbourg, which probably wouldn't happen anyways. But those are the two big areas. The northern part of this main group here is a little weak. They had to split up a block, um, so they don't really want the French knowing that. But they've got a lot of reinforcements coming in, so if they can just stave off anything bad this turn and not give up these victory point spaces on Plan 17, 
then they're going to be in a pretty good, uh, pretty good spot. So the only combat that's going to happen is going to be in Belgium, where, of course, some more movement has happened. So let's show you what's going on up there. Big one is they moved some forces into the southern part of Belgium um, here, once I said to plug that gap. So the French couldn't split the two and then cause this northern part of the hinge to have to bring forces southwards. They want the hammer blow to be in the north and to wrap around almost near Dunkirk and Calais. Basically between Calais, Dunkirk, and uh, I'm not sure if it's Maubeuge or I'm not sure about that city. Um, but basically go in uh, near Cambrai. Uh, so that was the reason for plugging that gap. Here they stuck with the same forces in Namur, just going to try and wipe those guys out. Uh, they, they put this block around here to the back side because they didn't want the British VEF reinforcing in Namur and just slowing things up. They wanted to keep them in France if possible so that they can pin them down and then let the big parts of the forces swing north. Um, I did something I normally don't do, which is engage in Antwerp. Usually I just leave some cavalry behind to help just keep that group pinned in. But it's always something that's in the back of your mind. Um, so we're going to try and, and wipe those guys out with one swing. This here, to me, is not that concerning. It will fall eventually, so I don't really care if it's now or later. But this is the mistake that the, the Germans made in, in reality of not moving through Belgium quick enough. There were stop gaps and areas where they were slowed down. So I normally play where I just leave Antwerp and keep going, as is pretty much historical. The King of Belgium basically held up up there. But uh, we're, we're going to try and wipe them out. And if we don't get this one turn, if we don't wipe them out just like we did Liege, we're going to know it was a failure. Not the end of the world, but we really need to just roll straight on through. Um, there's also this thing called breakout movement, and I don't think I did it in Liege. It's not that big of a deal because I would have ended up in Antwerp anyways, but it's just something to think about um, that I have to remind myself of. So let's do these two combats here. The uh, Germans will... Uh, assign Big Bertha to Antwerp. And now the French are going to come back with some attacks probably. So that's the thing about this is you have to manage your your artillery and your air power because you're not, you're not just attacking. You don't get it back before the enemy attacks. So you kind of have to balance. Um, they're still primarily on the offensive. So they're going to put a three down here in Namur and... They have a couple more left. Very tempted to add some more, but they're not going to. They're just going to leave it at that and save their others for later. Um, now, the uh, allies, I believe, now can respond and add artillery in. I know they can't during the opening moves. The only thing I'm confused on is if they can do that for the Belgians. They're not going to um, because I don't want to look it up, and it's not that big of a deal. Um... They could try and slow them up up here, but let's just pick our fights for later. We're going to really try and hammer down in the south. Okay, so let's spend the logistics point to turn Big Bertha into a railgun. Fun stuff. And we are aiming against the fort at Antwerp. We have not a good roll. Um, three fours and a five. So that's only going to inflict one on the fortress which means that there will still be one left over to fire back. On a five and a six, they roll a one, so no big deal. And now we will flip down. It's 2v16, so not exactly um, in their odds. So now they're going to be rolling um, on sixes. The, ally, the central powers because they're going against a fort. They can ignore five, so they're really rolling on sixes. So they can take three dice, but they have 16 strength points, and they have a pretty good roll. Two sixes and a three for a total of 15. So 15 on the table of 16 gets them five hits, which is going to be more than enough to take that out. Um, the Central power, or the allies are going to roll two. They get a hit, and that'll reduce them down to 15. So that pretty much does it. That is a 
relatively easy victory for the Central Powers. I'm not sure if this fort gets converted. We're going to convert it to a one um, German. Not really sure, but I doubt it's going to come back into play. That will give them another victory point. So now they're up to two. Remember, the victory points are different for each year. 1914, obviously Paris is the objective. No hexes in France is the objective for the Allies at the end of turn two. And if you ever have six more victory points than your opponent, then you also win. So it is important to get those hexes um, if you can. So they're sort of sitting at two now because of those two Belgian spaces. So I'll convert that fort in just a second. Now we can do this one here. So it's going to be three rolling against the fortress in Nemur. They get two fours and a five, which is going to do absolutely nothing. Take those artillery markers out of there. And now we can go into combat. So it's one versus eight. So there is enough. That's five, six, seven, eight. Let's roll it up here. Okay, so two sixes is enough to do it. Um, the fives are ignored, of which there were a couple. It's actually three fives and three fours. So that was pretty good roll overall. And then the Belgians will roll one. And they rolled six. So we'll take them down to five. So this block goes away. Fortress didn't even get damaged. That'll go on to three victory points now. I'll find out about the fort. But that does it for the Belgians. Very effective, very quick, exactly what you want on that front. Uh, because if you waste any time, any more time than is necessary, you're going to really leave yourself in the gutter. Um, lastly, I want to say I really love these markers. The control markers you put down, it really illustrates a very clear uh, line of control that shows you where the front line is. Because that can get confusing sometimes. Um, I should do this here because this is currently where we're at. Um, but it really shows you where the front line is really easily. And I love that. It looks, it's a very pretty game, honestly. Um, I love the aged look to the board. Everything's kind of just beige. Um, but uh, Luxembourg has fallen, unfortunately. RIP to them. Uh, so now what we'll do is we'll do the same thing for the Allies, and then we'll do it all over again. So it's very much back and forth for these. So now on to the French. So just to clarify, I, I knew this. I had just forgotten. Um, forts are basically like blocks. Is basically how they work. You can't just like march into an area and because you're the only one in it. Just take it. Like I couldn't move here. Just boom. Now I have a four fortress of my own. You have to defeat them as if they were blocks. So up here in Antwerp, we were totally good. Um, we rolled like five sixes. So that was enough to reduce it from two to zero. The first six reduces it. The rest of the sixes are applied to the blocks and then any remaining sixes reduces the fort. So we were good in that aspect because um, we rolled five. Here, I don't really remember. You do because you just watched it. But um, I'm going to say that I did it there. So that's my first instance of maybe cheating in here. We'll see how it goes. But I'm, I'm going to say we took care of that fort. We might not have. There might be like a one Belgium fort. And I realize that is important. Um, but let's just say that they got lucky there. And let's see how it goes. So just to clarify, that's how forts work. And I got it from now on. Okay, so I went through and looked. And I've kind of got the impression from the rule book. And honestly, the more I say it, the more it makes sense that before dogfighting is allowed on turn two, you can't do what I wanted to do as the Germans and just like uh, frustrate your opponent like by putting up another one. So one and one, one and one, one and one so far. Um, because it, they didn't have, the, the, the airplanes weren't really designed at this point to have effective weapons to combat other planes. So let's just say that that's the, that's the case right now, which it is. What are they? What are the German planes going to do? You're one and one, and you just ride around in front of them. You wave at them, you yell at them. Like, what exactly are you doing to stop them? So, I wanted to stop them from doing that, but I don't actually think you're allowed to. Uh, I'm not sure, but that's my interpretation of the rule. I still wouldn't have used my reconnaissance points anyways uh, because I didn't really need 
need need to. So we're just going to ignore um, the German markers here and um, just go through with the French ones. So it actually doesn't work out like they wanted to, the Germans, but it's fine. That's how the beginning of the game goes. But it would have been very fun had it worked out that way. So what we got here is they are able, they're able, able to see this one. I'm going to leave these flipped down um, for the entirety of it just so I can remember. It's really hard to keep track of all this stuff alone. They have a one here, which allows them to flip one block. So I don't, usually I put one thing on one side, one the other, so let's randomly mix this up here. And they're gonna get to flip the five that was there. So that tells you the split they did. It was a, a 10 they moved from Diedenhofen and split it. So there you go. In Diedenhofen, I think they actually used a fake one. They did. They're trying to be tricky when I still thought they could do that. Um, one. They'll get one here in Mets. It's going to be a 10. One here in Sarberg. And one here. So let me mix these up. And they're going to get the four block the infantry again. Good for them. With a one each in those places. So now they kind of have an idea of what's ahead of them. And now they can make their decisions on moving. So their primary forces are located down in the south and up in the north. So let's give you a view here. So they've got a pretty good force down here in the south and a good force here. So where, how they're going to split that up, we will determine and I'll come back after they've moved. Okay, so the French counterattack has begun. Just as in reality, the French did not know whether or not the probe to the north was a diversion to distract from an attack from the south. They still had PTSD from the Franco-Prussian War uh, back in the late 1800s and 1870s. So uh, they weren't sure and, you know, operating under that same assumption, weren't sure. But now that we've kind of seen some of the forces that are up in this area attacking Antwerp, we're pretty certain that that's where the brunt of the German forces are. Also, having seen what's down here, we're pretty sure of that. So, um, they've engaged all along this line, including the direct border. So, split the forces up from Epinal um, and Nancy went north, but engaged here in the hopes of just tying these forces down. It's going to be pretty hard to get them down here with the amount that we're pushing in the north. Engaged um, in Metz with uh, actually a pretty good number of forces. And then the big one here is going to be whether or not that plug by the Germans is going to hold or not. It's not very well defended, and the French, having seen that, have really thrown some guys in. They could have diverted some to help the BEF, but they're going to try and set the Germans back here with some heavy losses in the middle of their line. And if they can punch through here and deal them a blow, it's really going to soften up that northern front because they can't sustain it. Um, if they're trapped from behind, basically, if the French are allowed to cut north. So now we move on after uh, the movement. Um, we'll do combat, which involves placing down the um, artillery. And there will be artillery for both sides. If you use artillery on your action phase, you can't use it for the other one. So that's the big part here. We're going to assign artillery for both sides and then resolve combat. Okay, so the artillery for both sides has been um, placed, and we'll start from the north and work our way south. So the French matched up evenly here with the Germans for two each um, on the artillery. There's no fortresses, unlike any of the other combat we've done so far. So these are fives and sixes straight up. So both sides roll a five, 
and that will reduce each of them by one. And normally you wouldn't see what these are, so you don't know when you do a hit how many your opponent has. So the, the Germans are still completely blind on what they're facing here. So these two are done. Now we'll go on down to the next encounter. Three and one. Germans didn't have as much artillery available because they used it on their turn, obviously. So they're going to get outgunned here pretty good. And they don't have a lot to give in this area. So a five and a six, and then a four. So a four doesn't count, but it would if they had gas technology. There's your four. There's your five and six. So they'll reduce this by two down to three. And this is what the Germans are worried about. Now, for um, this one here, a little bit further down, the French tried to fake out the Germans and Mets by placing first a, a zero and then a one, but they weren't having it. They have the four for the fort, so they knew they were going to, wasn't really any need, but they thought maybe they could peel off one if they did it that way. So big fortress. So they roll a three for the French. It's going to do nothing. And the Germans out of that four only roll a six. So it's really acceptable. The French put a big stack of 20 into Mets. They really wanted to show that they weren't messing around and throw in a lot of forces here to really rattle the Germans. Um, and now we can go all the way down here to this hex where the allies have slightly more. Once again, not much to give. And that's not a very good roll for anybody. Very low numbers. Two, one, and Two. So no hits there. Now we can go into combat. You can always do combat where you didn't do um, artillery, but you're not obligated to. So now let's go south to north. So we are going to do combat here. So that's seven against seven. Big three or cavalry really helped out. So they're going to have to roll all of the dice pretty much here. So here we go for the allies. And these are fives and sixes once again. So they rolled two. And now we can do the same for the central powers. They rolled three. So you can choose how you take them. We'll go down here to two. And then flip these guys back up. Or actually, we'll do three, two. And then here, they're going to take three hits. So five, four, three. Three, and they'll take one there. Whenever you do the compact, you can flip them back up. So obviously you're ready for next turn and you don't have the, the knowledge anymore. It doesn't stay up. So now they've debated here whether or not they have nine against the Germans, eight. So they're very tempted, but they don't want to lose and reveal what they have and it not really be worth it but also it's a free swing so I think they are so they'll reveal here it's nine versus eight so for the allies fives and sixes they got four hits 
and they'll replace these two with blue ones. Just so they can roll all black. And now the allies will roll their eight. And they hit three. So it's going to be from eight down to four. From nine down to six. Pretty happy with that. The first fight could have gone a little bit better, but all in all, they're happy to take that. So now we can go up to Mets and flip down that big 19 now. Is what it is. It's going to be 19 22 against 10. So the allies just got to roll three. And they're only going to be hitting on sixes because of the four. So they roll 10, which with 22. It's going to get them only three hits, or let me make sure, yes, only three hits. Um, so the first six will go towards reducing this, and the last two will remove that from ten down to eight, but let me just leave out two there to remind myself. And now they were, I guess, at ten, so they have to roll all of those, and they're hitting on fives and sixes. One, two, three, four, five. Yikes. Five here for the Germans. So this two will go down to eight. And that 19 will go down to 14. So heavy losses sustained there. Makes it five and or six in total, if you count um, the one from the fort earlier. So that is what it is. No progress without loss. That's the story of the First World War. So here they're going to attack, and it's a total of five against 13, so they just do get to roll on the table, which is sometimes a good thing, sometimes not. They are going to roll on fives and sixes, though. Not as good of a roll, they only get a seven. So seven on 13 only gets them two hits, whereas the Germans get to roll five, and they also get two hits. So that will be down to 10. And then two hits, they take one from each. They are weak. And then lastly, right over here. 15, 16 total against four. We'll roll three again, one of the fives and sixes. They get 10. And 10 with 16. It's some five hits, which is just more than they needed. The central powers. Oof, all twos. Four twos. And that is not good. So that will eliminate this German block, and they do no damage in resistance. So that is unfortunate for the central power. So that's what they were afraid of, and they knew it could happen. 
So now that they're they're opened up here to the French possibly turning in this corner or advancing north. And remember these hexes are uh, lost, the victory points are lost if you lose control of them. So they're going to have to divert some of these forces down. And there's a good chunk here, so that's big for them to be able to take this hex away. Um, that does it for the first action phase. They'll do another one. I'm not going to do the second one in uh, as much detail. I'll just come back to you afterwards and say, hey, look, this is what happened. Um, only if something really big is going to happen am I going to bring it in, just because it's very time consuming to do it all on camera. But that's how it works in case you wanted to see it in action. As always, I try and do the first um, in full detail so you can see it. So now we're going to refresh everything and go on to the Germans. Okay, through the German action phase here and the front lines have moved a bit. Um, this area that was punctured by the French, the Germans have moved down from Namur. The forces that were there, not many, certainly are going to be outgunned, um, but they reckon that if they do bring forces down, that means the French can't move. They're not going to fight here this turn, so the French, if they attack, even if they wipe everything out, they're not going to be able to either reinforce or march north, so at least hold them down and keep them in that hex. Added, um, the, the starting forces in Koblenz slid into Diedenhofen, and the forces that were there slid here to the north so that they could counter that and nothing was done in the south. It's just dire down there. Um, they captured uh, Dunkirk, just with some cavalry running out there. We'll see if the British come to fight. I imagine they will. And then the big force, there's like 53 strength points among these three blocks, which is, I think, more than all of these French forces combined. So it's a huge group right here. So things look kind of bad, but the German forces are just waiting to get into position. So there's a big group here that's going to slide down on the BEF. And it's actually the only combat the Germans are going to do. They are saving their artillery, um, the ones that they didn't use, and they used most of it here. Um, in defense. So um, all in all, I mean, I'm going to run through this just because it's such a big fight. It's seven artillery for the Germans for two plus the two of the fortress for the uh, British. So they will spend that logistics point. They want to knock out this fortress. They're going to get four dice to do it. Big Bertha has had mixed results. Has wiped out one. Hasn't really helped with Antwerp. And even worse, they get nothing on this one. Absolutely nothing. So now it's going to be three against four, with the allies having four. Because they get two for the artillery they have there, and then two for the fortress. And remember, uh, six is for the fort, so it's going to be a six for both sides. So that first six will reduce. And then the other six will reduce these guys. I feel like it's always on the side of the block that makes you get a new block. It's never anything but that. Okay, so that artillery will go away. Certainly not the grand opening of the fortress that they were hoping for. But they could still wipe that out here. I believe that that six, if they roll a six, uh, it would take out the fortress. Um, now remember, the effects of the fort don't go away, so even they would still get it until the end of the turn, so it won't really affect much this time around. So the, uh, I can flip this block down now, it's 16 to 6, BEF really outnumbered, but holding out here. So we're going to be rolling on 6s, and they get a not very good roll of 8. 8 on 16 is going to be 2 hits, so definitely slowed up here. 6 for the British. It's going to yield them 2 hits themselves. So that first 6 is going to go to knocking out that fort. Uh, it's a good first step, but you know they're probably just going to rebuild it, honestly, with an economy point, uh, the Allies. Um, then the other, the other hit they have will go against the forces. See, there you go. They have to take that block down. So now they're down to five total. And these two hits will go 
and take that down to 14. So the fort's gone. It'll probably get replaced. But everybody else can uh, stand back up because that's the only fighting they're going to do. The French are going to do a lot more, so I'm not going to cover that quite as extensively. But the BEF overall got lucky, held on. All right, so just wrapped up the French action phase, which will wrap up um, the turn, first turn. And overall, some pretty big gains. Um, it was a stalemate up in uh, Dunkirk. Further down, they completely eradicated the German forces here. You got big time roll and sent them running. Did not attack here. They did attack here. Um, they reduced it. There was eight. Uh, German uh, strength points down, down, now down to six, and the fort at Metz is only a two. So that's starting to look a little vulnerable for the Germans. Uh, what's worse, though, is that you can see this four right here. The Allies rolled four in this position and completely eradicated the German forces. So they did not bother to attack here because they don't have a lot to fight with. They don't want to counterbalance this victory with a defeat here by losing their forces. But that's big because now at the end of the turn, they're going to score four victory points for Plan 17. Um, and that's pretty darn good. They're going to have strategic redeployment where they can shuffle some forces around. And I'm sure the Germans are going to slide some down here, but they can, you know, they have to balance. And that's what you're forcing them to do at this point is decide what's important. And more victories in the South means less troops you have to face in the North. So... This right here is a crisis for the Germans. They have to plug this gap. There's not a whole lot of forces left for the French to keep grinding with, but if the, the Germans won't know how many they're going to divert uh, from other places. That, right now they're really strong here, and they've got a pretty good amount of forces here as well. So with the amount that will come in, you know, in two turns, this front, they don't know how it's going to look. So the, the French, they worry, may double down and really push here like they're doing here so you know it, it could end up you know whereas it was supposed to be a hinge it could just kind of be like a revolving door and do something like this now remember victory condition is you take Paris so that's number or priority number one for the French they they will have to defend there but you've got some space to give they don't even mind falling back to the Marne which is the historical um, line of advance for the Germans so even if you that was the decision uh, was whether or not to abandon the position here and retreat to the Somme, which is also kind of historical, um, but uh, they haven't made that decision. They'll have time to do it. But um, all in all, if you take this first turn, the Allies are feeling pretty good about themselves. Now, they haven't even faced half of the German forces. There's still another half they haven't even seen that are just laying around, lying around in Belgium. But they can't, that's not up to them. They had to fight in front of them. They held where they had to hold, and they advanced where they needed to advance. So all in all, very good turn for the Allies. So what we'll do here is um, do all the production phase stuff, hop back in with the action phase, where I'll tell you what happened during the production phase, and uh, go from there. This may be a separate video. I'm trying to record this all as one, so I don't know where I'll split it up. But overall, first turn, good start.